Hey guys, on today's episode, I am back in the warehouse with over 300 cars. Now, when I walked in last time on the way to the Bizzarini, I saw this uh, 1967 Corvette Stingray 427, and it is in need uh, of some help. And from what I found out from the owner, it hasn't been moved in over 30 years, meaning it's literally sat here for 30 plus years. Now, if you look inside, uh, you'd have to agree that that would be the case. There's lots going on there. So we're actually gonna pull this out. There's a hose over there that we uh, hooked up and we found. We're gonna give this a healthy wash and see if we can bring it back to life. So I'm really excited. That and a whole lot more coming up on this episode of Drive and Protect. Hey guys, I wanted to hop in real quick and pass along a message from the owner of this huge collection uh, to you, the viewer. He said, hey, uh, I've gotten thousands of emails. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So he wanted to pass that along. And number two, with COVID, uh, everything is basically shut down. The DMV, mass transit, so he can't get a lot of his workers in. They can't move titles around, all this kind of crazy thing. So he said, hey, can you just let your viewers know I'm working on uh, all the emails and uh, hopefully I'll get back to you soon, meaning you guys soon. Uh, so just a little bit of patience uh, with respect to that would be amazing. Uh, but you're gonna see a 1960 67 Corvette that is absolutely gorgeous and we spent a lot of time uh, restoring it and that is another car that's uh, going up for sale so feel free to email uh, the, the link in the description. On a personal note I want to give you a sincere thank you for supporting the Amwell brand especially during this really challenging time. I've come out with a new summer line of clothing a lot of you have purchased it and then taken selfies and sent it to me and that means a whole lot. It's uh, it kind of meaningful to see somebody wearing the brand that I built over this many years so thank you for doing that. Without further ado check out this unbelievable restoration from beginning to end uh, the car is absolutely phenomenal. I hope you enjoy. After inspecting the vet closely to get a game plan for my detail, step number one was to ask if I could flip on the breakers without getting electrocuted. Now, keep in mind, this is a different warehouse than the Bizzarini, so we have a bit more light, some adequate space, and a nearby sink that could be hooked up to a hose, so life was pretty good. Huh. Next, Dan and I pushed the vet out of its resting place and into a makeshift wash bay across the warehouse. First, we removed everything in the interior that wasn't bolted down, and for those of you who are about to leave a comment, we didn't remove the seats because I was on the road and didn't have all my tools in case of a major issue. As you can see, the mats needed to be removed along with a few other items including some toilet paper. Then Dan quickly vacuumed up the small bits and pieces to get a better idea of what we were working with. Behind the seats, we actually found a few egg corns from a furry friend, but the interior was in surprisingly good shape overall. Now, as we were preparing for the initial sweep phase, Dan noticed a few more pieces of paper jammed into the door hinge that seemed like it would never end. Once he was all done removing the paper, he continued with what we call a sweep or an initial sweep. Now, this is an initial quick vacuum to get a better idea of what is going on in the car and how the material is reacting to what we're doing. Plus, we like to prevent all this junk from getting caught into the shampoo machine and clogging it up in a future step. While he was doing the initial sweep, I used ammo lather, an interior brush, and throw away terry towels to remove most of the dirt and mold on the seats. Then we continued the same process on the rest of the interior. On the steering wheel, we used a scrub pad and lather to lift the years of caked on gunk. Look at the before and after. A completely different color and texture was revealed. We repeated the steps on the tight spots in the interior, which took a while, so much so that I actually forgot the camera was rolling and I set up an interior light directly in front of the lens. Sorry about that. Once the initial sweep was completed, phase two is to use a 50-50 mixture of white distilled vinegar and water along with a steam machine to clean up any remaining mold and mildew type smells. 
With a few sprays of 50-50 on the vinyl type material seats, I wrap the head of the steamer with a microfiber towel to remove the stiff bristles from the equation as I only want the heat from the steam to increase the cleaning ability of the mixture. If you happen to be working in teams like I am, then have the other person wipe down the warm seats immediately. These particular seats have a lot of seams or intricate parts that trap dirt, so we use the sniper type nozzle to blow out the gunk before wiping it dry again. We repeated the same process on the rest of the plastics, vinyl, and buttons on the dashboard. Phase 3 was working on the carpets. First I sprayed Ammo Shag fabric cleaner and allowed 2 minutes to soak. Then I used the steamer again but without the microfiber towel wrap and gently agitated the carpet to bring the dirt to the surface. Then Dan immediately followed up with another spray of shag and a quick scrub with a soft bristle brush to help loosen up the crusty fabric before shampooing with our portable Little Green Pro Heat. Now this didn't actually make hot water so the steam machine was carrying the heavy load with respect to hot water in this case. We repeated the same steps on the back seat area as well. Clearly, as you can see, this definitely needed to be shampooed and the reservoir was filled with deep black wastewater when we were done. With the inside looking and smelling 100% better, it's now time to focus on the engine compartment while allowing a few hours for the carpet to wick. Now, because this is an older vehicle, we stayed with the steam method here to minimize the amount of water used. The goal was to remove the mold and greasy texture, which would liven up the appearance a bit before it goes to its new home. With the engine spiffed up, now the heavy lifting begins on the exterior. To do this safely, inspect the paint closely to find scratches, rock chips, flaking paint, or other issues that may be exacerbated even by a gentle wash. Next, we filled the aerators with frothy and our buckets with filtered water, ammo foam for the paint and ammo brute specifically for the wheels, and then we put them to the side. Once our tools were ready, Dan and I laid a heavy coat of frothy on the paint to gently soften and remove the first layers of grime. Allowing a few minutes of dwell time can be helpful especially on very old paint because it can carry away the dirt without heavy agitation. Notice the brownish color of the frothy after a few minutes as it travels down and off the paint. Even the trim is starting to show signs of life again. After a few minutes, we added another layer as we could see it was working well on the paint and allowed it to dwell even longer while we focused on the wheels. Make sure to use a stiff bristle brush on the rubber itself to remove the caked on gunk. Now, as you can see, the vet, although dirty, is in pretty good shape after sitting for so many years. Next, I rinsed off the layers of frothy and during this process, I could almost feel and hear the paint go, Ugh, just it started to breathe again and the paint started to pop and the car just almost came up 10 inches. It just looked and felt so much better and all the junk came onto the floor. It was kind of a fun moment throughout this whole process. Afterwards, we gently agitated the stubborn dirt from the paint with the microfiber towel technique, which avoids double dipping or redunking wash mitts into dirty water and then scrubbing the paint again. We also used our interior brushes to clean around and in between the emblems and then scrub the floor mats before rinsing once again. Okay, at this point we frothied the paint, then we washed it, we scrubbed it, and it looks a thousand times better. But there are some uh, grease stains all over the place here on this side of the hood, on that side, and certainly right here and on the glass. Uh, so you can wash it until your eyeballs fall out and your hands <laughs> come off. You're not going to get it off. You have to actually use uh, a degreaser, which we have in here, straight degreaser. Use it on the glass uh, and the paint here. What you want to do is let it sit, I don't know, 30 seconds or so. But what I like to do is take a, my glove, sort of just rub it and see if it's, it's coming off. If it starts to come off, then you can wipe it immediately. You don't want to let it sit forever. But uh, this is a really good example of using the right product at the right time. Uh, so once this comes off, which it is right here, um, pretty easily, which is great. Uh, we're going to dry it off, polish it, and I think we're going to be uh, home free. This thing's looking pretty good. Now, most spots came off immediately, while a few others took a bit more time. The goal is to work slow and to take small bites out of the issue at one time. Think archaeology, not demolition. Small brush strokes, not just dynamite, if paint preservation is your goal, which it always is and should be for all detailers. Now the glass, although stubborn, is still somewhat easy to fix because a long handle razor blade will cut through the stain quickly, especially if it's surface contamination and not subsurface etching or stains. To do this, keep the blade at approximately a 45 degree angle, add lubrication, and then gently scrape. 
If done properly, the glass will look perfect with no scratches or gouges. Next, we dried the paint with microfiber towels, revealing clean but love-marked or faded paint, which is to be expected after that many years, and will require a compound and polish to restore it to its former glory. Before you polish, if you happen to find some dried up gunk that wasn't removed with degreaser, you can use a plastic razor blade to gently lift and remove prior to compounding the paint. For the test spot, we're using a microfiber cutting pad and a large throw dual action polisher. First, prime the pad with your compound by hand to coat all the fibers, then blow out the pad with compressed air or rub with a microfiber towel. Once you're done with that, then add two dots of compound and perform a quick mow down technique. The mow down technique is quick side to side motions to gently remove the top layer of dried up paint, or in my endless analogies, think of it like dead chalky skin. The microfiber pad lifts the dead skin off the surface so that you can see what you're actually working on and then take the appropriate steps to preserve or restore the paint in this case. Now with the top layer removed, then you can slow down your arm speed and focus on removing the imperfections. For those of you who really want to get nerdy, like super insanely nerdy about detailing and all the techniques, and you want to check out some behind the scenes footage, I've actually started another channel called the Ammo NYC Studio. Now this will take place in my new training facility, what I call a studio. It will have live feeds, we'll have podcasts, we'll have all kinds of stuff, but this is really focused on more of the pro or the DIY guy who's crazy and wants to know every little detail. We're going to have longer episodes. Now the building is still in construction, this is a dream come true for me. It took me almost a year to build and we're not done yet, but please subscribe, check out the behind the scenes tour of the new facility and all the cool things that we're going to do. The link is above. After just one pass on our test spot, you can already see the paint is reacting well to correction and we were on the right track. So from there, it was time to listen to my audiobook and spend a few hours restoring and preserving the original paint. As I approach the hood, you can see that there was one little leftover spot of stuck on grime from earlier in the day that would not budge, so I left it there for the compounding stage, which it actually removed it pretty quickly. But once you do that, you have to immediately blow out the pad or replace it all together as it's now contaminated and potentially can cause marring in the paint if left uncleaned. Next with a new pad, I worked on the black hood scoop that had a few crow's feet and plenty of swirls. After one pass, the swirls were easily removed, but the paint looked whitish or hazy under the lights. But after a second step polish, the depth and clarity was restored from left to right. After an hour or two, the paint was restored and it was now time to focus on the chrome. Okay, we're rounding third in the Stingray detail and of course, one of the last steps I like to do is clean up the chrome. Now I have a bit of uh, chrome polish here. Normally I would just take a microfiber towel, a few dabs, you can go in by hand, and so on. But when you have this much chrome everywhere and it's starting to pit a little bit, one of the things I like to do is to take a three inch polisher, use an old microfiber cutting pad, take a bit of the, your favorite chrome polish, dab it on there. Doesn't need to be pretty. In this case, put your glasses on. Now, basically what you did there is you just saved yourself 10,000 arm movements, especially when you have a lot of uh, a chrome like this here. Now we picked up a whole ton of uh, little bits that it's starting to oxidize. So if you have a three inch and you have a microfiber cutting pad, especially an old one, use your favorite chrome polish and it just really picks up quite well. For those of you who have ever polished out a chrome wheel by hand, know if you can use a machine in these tight areas, do it. Your hands, knuckles, and joints will thank you later. However, with smaller pads comes a smaller surface area that fills up with residue much faster, so you'll need to blow out the pads more frequently to maintain the same cleaning effectiveness. 
We repeated the same steps on what felt like endless chrome bumpers and trim around the vet. Now, the combination of all these little details is what brings the vehicle's overall condition back to life. Keep any one part out and it just sticks out like a sore thumb against the restored parts. So do your best to allocate enough time to work these smaller areas. Next up was glass. For old smudgy windows, or really any windows for that matter, I use a scrub pad and window cleaner to cut through the grease before using a squeegee. At this point, this seems to be the most effective method, but glass, as we all know, is incredibly frustrating in the cleaning process because there's no forgiveness. So I'm always playing with new techniques and I'll let you know if I find anything more effective. Afterwards, I final vacuumed and touched up the interior while Dan applied ammo mud tire dressing to the rubber, which drank it up in a matter of seconds. So you need to add a few more coats on super old rubber. Finally, I applied the all new ammo reflex to the paint and allowed it to cure for about one hour before adding a light layer of cream show car wax for insane light reflection, especially on the voluptuous and cockpit like rear of this incredible era in Corvette history. Once we were all done, we could really appreciate the huge difference from before and after. Well guys, we're all done and the car looks absolutely amazing now. Uh, we spent probably seven, almost eight hours on this and the before and after is probably the biggest one I've ever seen uh, of all the cars I've ever done. Uh, there was some serious uh, stains here. We had to use a lot of degreaser and then of course polished it out. Now this car, from what I understand, hasn't been moved in 33 years, which is completely insane, um, but it's awesome at the same time. We were really happy, Dan and I, to uh, bring this thing back. And the coolest part is the owner is actually selling it. So I'll put a link in the description below and you can find out more information and contact them and figure out how much it's, you know, how much he's uh, selling it for, et cetera. If you have seen uh, my previous video when I did the Vizzarini, uh, we have a ton of cars that need to get done. So if you see one that you think you'd like me to do first, leave a comment uh, below and I'll try to uh, work that out with the owner and say, hey, can we do that one that uh, the fans want uh, done first? So as always, thank you for watching. Dan and I are completely exhausted and have a ridiculously long drive home, but it was absolutely worth it. This car is so beautiful. Thanks for watching. See you guys next time.